Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Ten to Life, where we talk all things true crime. We talk about existing cases, we talk about old cases, we talk about cold cases, we talk about controversial cases, we really talk about all of it. And the reason we do is because we try to help generate awareness and ultimately bring justice for many of these victims. So if you're brand new and stopping by for the first time, welcome. I hope you enjoy today's case video and if you do, please consider subscribing to the channel by hitting that subscribe button below. And for all of my returning subscribers, welcome back. So happy to have you here and thank you for your ongoing support. Now, contrary to what it may look like, I promise guys, I'm not wearing pajamas right now. I know that like these feather pajamas out there are all the rage. This is actually just a shirt. So we're vibing out. I'm seeing if I like it. TBD. I obviously didn't iron it. So sorry if it's distracting, but we're going to kind of just go with it. Let me know what you think. So today, the case we're talking about is one that is happening in real time and that so many of you guys have been requesting, and it unfortunately is a case of another missing child out of the East Coast. On Monday, January 31st, 2022, at approximately 9 a.m., the police department was called to the Buckrow Point Apartment Townhouse Complex in Hampton, Virginia, and Corey Bigsby had reported that his four-year-old son, Cody Bigsby, was missing. He said that he hadn't seen him since 2 a.m., that he searched everywhere in the house, and that young little Cody was nowhere to be found. Now, an Amber Alert wasn't able to be immediately issued because the circumstances surrounding little Cody's disappearance were still unclear. It wasn't 100% certain that this could have been an abduction. And immediately, the Hampton Police Department started questioning the parents and what their potential involvement may have been. It's now been two weeks and Cody still has not been found, yet we have received a lot more of information regarding the father, regarding the mother, and regarding little four-year-old Cody. And all of that new information not only points to enormous red flags on the father's part, but also quite a few red flags on law enforcement's part. So let's get right into it. Sent to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. Cody Bigsby is an adorable little four-year-old boy, and he's the middle child of four siblings. Cody has an older five-year-old brother and a set of twin brothers that are two years old. Cody was last seen wearing all black clothing and Spider-Man flip-flops. Now keep that piece of information close in your mind too, these Spider-Man flip-flops. And I'm going to explain why here as we go. Cody's father, Corey Bigsby, the man who called this in and reported Cody is missing, is a retired army member, and he's a father of eight. Corey retired in September 2017 as Sergeant First Class. Corey has been receiving money from his military retirement that appears to be approximately $1,700 per month. At the time of the four-year-old Cody's disappearance, he had three other children living in that townhouse with him. And neighbors also had stated that at the time, Corey had a live-in girlfriend. However, that wasn't confirmed by law enforcement and it hasn't been made publicly known yet if that detail has been confirmed by anybody else. Four-year-old Cody's mother, Dina Abdul Karim, lives and works in Washington, D.C. She too is also a veteran and apparently also attends school. Not much has been confirmed or said about how involved Dina was with her children or the last time in which Dina had a known sighting with her children. And trying to even pinpoint details about Dina proved to be very difficult. It wasn't just a simple Google search that you could find information on her. But what we did find was that in 2008, Dina had filed charges against Corey Bigsby. She filed assault charges against him and apparently he had choked her. According to the records and the charges, Corey had allegedly choked Dina and also bit her. Now, there have been a couple different things floating around in terms of custody, but the custody arrangements and the actual concrete custody arrangements have not yet been solidified. What we do know is that Corey had all four of those children by himself, raising them in that townhouse since 2020. But how he got custody of these four children seems to still be a bit of a mystery as to the why or to the what happened. It's been alleged that at one point in time, Dina dropped the children off with Corey and then just never returned to pick them up. But then it's also been said that Dina dropped the children off for just a visit and that during that visit, Corey actually moved, taking the children with him, and changed his number. So while the custody arrangements are unclear, 
What we do know is that those four children were in Corey's possession, and what we also know is that the four-year-old missing boy, Cody, was also in his possession when he disappeared. Now, something that's a little bit odd about this case, and you'll see why here in just a minute, is that in just 2019, a little boy by the name of Noah also went missing from this exact same area, and he was actually found at the Hampton Steam Plant just 10 days later. Now, Noah's case was an awful situation of child neglect, child abuse by his mother, and she's still awaiting sentencing for all of this. But you're going to see how this starts to loop in a little bit. So police arrive at the scene after receiving that phone call from Corey, where he stated that he hadn't seen his son, his four-year-old son, since 2 a.m., that he had searched through the house and that he had no success of finding him. Corey had told authorities that he last saw him at 2 a.m., now, my question with that is, did you see him because you were checking on him in the bedroom while he was fast asleep, or was Cody going to sleep at 2 a.m., and that's when you put him to bed and last saw him? Which, if that's the case, what four-year-old is going to bed at 2 a.m.? But even more on the opposite side, if he was already fast asleep and, you know, Corey was going to bed himself and decided to poke his head into his bedroom to check in on him, make sure, you know, get one quick glance of a sleeping child because it's the best sight in the world, quite honestly. My question with that is what happened from 2 a.m. to 9 a.m. in that six-hour window and how did this four-year-old suddenly vanish? And what also is interesting to me that stuck out as a detail is he described to authorities that the last known thing that his son was wearing was all black and Spider-Man flip-flops. Now tell me this, what four-year-old is wearing flip-flops to bed? This leads me to believe that he wasn't fast asleep in bed at 2 a.m. and perhaps they were doing something in the house or moving around. And that again just begs the question, what four-year-old is awake at 2 a.m. and wearing flip-flops? And the even bigger question is obviously, what happened in that six-hour window? Within eight minutes of receiving that call and police showing up to the house, canines were on the scene. They were searching for this young boy. Police also quickly asked for backup from the FBI, and they brought drones, a plane, and many other resources to try to find this young four-year-old. Those investigators started searching everywhere with police dogs, with drones on foot. They were trying to turn over any lead that would help them understand what could have happened to this young four-year-old. But again, immediately into this, the investigators' focus shifted back to the parents, as we see so often it happens in these cases. And he wanted to know more details about the whereabouts of the parents, the whereabouts of the children when they last saw them, and figure out could there be some sort of foul play happening here. So this is where the questioning kicks off. According to Police Chief Talbot, Corey was very cooperative. He immediately went down to the police station after reporting Cody as missing, and he cooperated and volunteered to answer any questions that they possibly could have, which this is a very good sign because sometimes we unfortunately don't see it play out this way. Around 4 a.m. on February 1st, after agreeing to do a polygraph, Corey asked for an attorney. Now, we have seen this happen. Sometimes they lawyer up whether it's out of guilt or not, but usually that happens before agreeing to do a polygraph. 20 minutes later, Corey again asked for an attorney, but they did not give him one. Polygraph ended up being taken anyway, and while the results of that haven't been publicly disclosed, Chief Talbot did say that there was a heated back and forth argument regarding those results, which in my opinion leads me to believe that Corey didn't necessarily pass with flying colors. Pretty quickly after Cody's disappearance, police and investigators became extremely suspicious. Police tape immediately went up in front of the residents and a full-blown investigation was launched. That same day of the polygraph on February 1st, the search for little young Cody began to really ramp up. Volunteers were called in to help with the search efforts and neighbors even joined in these searches and vowed to not give up until they found Cody. Investigators ended up going to that steam plant where the other little boy, Noah, had been found, but nothing was there. No sight of Cody, no sign of any foul play, no sign of any evidence, and it ended up being a dead end. Throughout the day and evening, they continued searching, again, by foot, using cadaver dogs, using drones, using all available resources that they possibly could. And the other three kids that were living with Corey at the time 
were pulled out of the home immediately by CPS. Now for CPS to come and pull the children out of the home so fast feels like a red flag, feels like they may know something that they haven't made public yet. And we saw also um, a version of this happen in the Orrin and Orson West case, also in the Summer Wells case, when the other children are removed from the home because they don't trust the welfare of those children being with that parent anymore. For whatever reasons that may be, and they haven't announced it or made it public, they still were very quick to pull those three children out of the home. And while this is a red flag, because typically in situations like this, and it's said that during a crisis, you want to keep everybody's life as stable as possible. You don't want to shift things too much. When this happens, it's something to look into and it's something to consider. So it appears that there may have been some reasonable doubt that maybe those other younger children were also possibly in harm's way. The very next day on February 2nd, the police identified the father, Corey Bigsby, as the sole person of interest. And they started asking community members to share any details that they have on Corey. They wanted to know about places he visited, where he shops for groceries, who he's with, about that girlfriend, what he does in his spare time, any information that they could possibly gather on this man. And again, they at this point hadn't announced why they thought he was the, a suspect, or and no less why he was the sole suspect. But this did come off the heels of that polygraph and those mass searches. Police then began asking people to start checking their own properties, to check in their backyard, to check if they ha saw anything, whether maybe Cody was hiding or if there was anything that seemed amiss, and ask them that if they found anything suspicious to please contact the authorities. And we also saw this with the Summerwells case too. By February 2nd, the search had narrowed in, and police were searching within a one-mile radius of that townhome. And this isn't a good, good sign, because when they don't cast a wider net, they believe that the crime happened close to home. And still, they hadn't re revealed why they thought that, but it did get more contained, and they were searching within that mile radius. This search also expanded, and they began using a dive team and boats. And... This appears as though they were looking more for a recovery rather than a rescue. The following day on February 3rd, police started handing out flyers. And on these flyers, they asked three very important and very pointed questions. One, do you know Cody, Corey, or the siblings? Have you seen any of them since Christmas? And this is a key question and we'll get to why. And three, do you live in Buckrow Point and do you have a ring, doorbell, or any other surveillance cameras? Again, with a broad missing persons or missing children's case, typically you don't see a flyer that has such pointed questions trying to get information not only about the residents, but about the father. And these questions were very pointed. Investigators clearly wanted to gather as much data as they could from the ring doorbells, from any surveillance cameras, for people who watched them come and go into the home. They had their eyes, it appeared, to be set on Corey. A forensic team was also brought in that day, and they were brought into the townhome to begin collecting evidence. At this point in time, Corey Bigsby's family retained an attorney for him. And remember, he had asked for an attorney previously at the police station, and they didn't give him one. So at this point, his family retains one for him. But this was two days after his original request, so he was unaware that his family had even retained this attorney for him. His new attorney, Jeff Ambrose, says that he went to the police station to speak with Corey, but that he was denied access to him. And he goes on to say that they denied access because they said that Corey had not requested an attorney, even though he clearly did. Twice. Corey's sister did an interview, and although she seems extremely agitated with everyone, she did say that she believes Cody is alive. Why There's nothing I can really heart. say at this point. We've retained counsel. And if you want, you can direct your questions to him. But, yeah, I'm not Do you believe that your brother is innocent? What can we say to def have you defend him? There's nothing I can say about that at this time. I think Cody is, is alive and well. We just need to find him. When is the last time you saw Cody? That is irrelevant. And I just told you, I don't want to speak on that. If I knew where he is, I would have found him by now. So I don't know. Why would I not think he's alive? Why would anybody rule out the point, the fact that he's alive? I also asked her when is the last time she spoke 
or even saw Cody and she refused to answer that. One of the things that she was very emphatic on though is where is Cody's mother and why isn't she here searching the ground and scouring this area like she is or all of these other agencies. She says that she resides in DC but said she had no idea where she was at this point. During that same evening in which the attorney is retained, the searches are happening in a much narrower focus, the flyer is being passed around, Corey Bigsby is arrested. And he was arrested on seven felony charges of child neglect. And the details that come from these charges was about to paint everything in an entirely new light. His arrest affidavit stated that on December 13th of 2021, Corey left Cody and the two-year-old twins at home for three hours while he drove and went to purchase a car in a different town of Virginia, which is 30 minutes away from Hampton. And when asked why he would leave a four-year-old and two-year-old twin boys behind while he goes and gallivants off to pick up a car, Corey tells them that they are too much of a burden to take with him whenever he leaves the house. Uh, hi, I'm sorry, it's two two-year-olds and a four-year-old and they're too much of a burden? No, it's called being a toddler and a baby and you are the parent, the caretaker. And sorry, not for nothing, Corey, but you've got eight kids. You know how this goes. This is not new information. First of all, who the heck leaves toddlers alone for one minute? For 10 minutes, but no less for a 30 minute round or a 60 minute, 30 minutes each way round trip. And you're leaving two two-year-olds and a four-year-old. I literally hyperventilate when I leave my two and a half year old just so I can run and use the bathroom. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he could get injured. What if he tries to climb something? What if he falls on something? What if he eats a detergent pod, even though they're locked up? I mean, to just willingly leave them in the home for that long when you could easily just plop them with you in the car or in the bus or whatever you did, whatever, you, however you went. Or don't go, even better, do not go. And even more than that, Tell me what parent calls their child a burden, especially when you're talking to law enforcement. I mean, how many freaking red flags can we fly up right now, guys? And you know what? I'll keep it 100 right now for you guys. Sometimes, yes, children can be a bit of a burden in certain situations. A blessing, but sometimes a burden. But to not ever enough to leave them behind and never enough to say that to an officer. Like, are you completely crazy? Get a babysitter. Take them with you. Or again, just don't go, Corey. So for that particular incident in December, he got three felony charges. But remember, there were seven. And the reason why is he only got three is because it was three children that he left behind. So you may be asking, well, where did the additional four come from? Well, this wasn't Corey's first rodeo because he did this again on January 25th, just a little over a month later. And this time, he left four of his children at home for over two hours. And where could Corey have possibly gone for two hours that was so important he had to leave four of his children behind? We don't know. He visited several different locations. However, those locations have not yet been announced. And just six days after this incident, he reported Cody is missing. Gee, I wonder what could, how something bad could have happened to one of these kids. I wonder how somebody could have gone missing. You're just leaving them in the house for hours on end whenever you feel like it, whenever you need to go run errands. How shocked are you that something bad happened? So because of this, Corey received four felony charges because it was four children this time that he left behind. Now, something that's very interesting about this, if you think back to that flyer, they say, has anybody seen Corey or the kids since Christmas? Yet this incident with the four children happened on January 25th and the incident with the three children happened on December 13th. The two incidents were admitted to by Corey himself. So, but yet they're still asking, have, has anybody seen these kids? Has anybody been able to verify that these children were around or that Cody was around since Christmas? Meaning, do they believe Cody went missing prior to Christmas? Perhaps during that window of the 13th to the 25th or on the 13th itself when Corey left him behind? And could Corey have made up that incident on the 25th of January just to make it look as though 
Cody still was safe and around and was also in the house left behind a month later, could Corey have lied and made up this entire incident that apparently happened on the 25th of January to make it look as though Cody was still around? Could he have in fact been missing much longer, but Corey had a longer lead time now to cover his tracks and to get his story straight, then use that 25th day as, you know, the incident in which you left them once again, because obviously you have no shame that you left them, and then you report him missing six days later. What's also weird about this is how long Corey voluntarily stayed at that police station answering questions. Now, usually you wouldn't think that that's weird because you would think that any parent is just trying to help out and give as much information as possible. But not if they're asking for a lawyer, not if they're asking for a lawyer twice. And he wasn't just there for a couple of hours answering questions. There are over 100 hours of interview footage. He was there for multiple days in a row prior to his arrest. So was he feeling guilty is one question. Why did he outright come forward with the information that he had left his children alone on two separate occasions? Or was he at that police department for so long and answering questions for 100 hours over the course of multiple days because he was trying to insert himself in the investigation to sniff out what the police know. Because we know that that is a very common thing to have happen, is when you are involved in a crime to show up to the search parties, to show up to the crime scene, to go to the vigils, to try and talk to police and overshare information, to look like you're being overly cooperative, because you really want to just suss out, what do they know? Are they on to me? What path are they going down? So what was the motive behind this? What was the thought process? Or was he truly just trying to be a helpful father here? After Corey's arraignment on February 4th, his attorney, Jeff Ambrose, went to visit Corey. But then Corey told him that he was held at headquarters, not, on, not out of volunteering, but involuntary. He said that the police chief was lying to the public and that he wasn't in fact there voluntarily. He also tells his attorney that he asked for an attorney twice. When Chief Talbot was asked about this, if Corey did in fact request an attorney and get denied, the chief states, and I quote, uh, Mr. Bigsby is a 43-year-old man who's had a full career in the army. He retired to a position of authority. He seems to be quite intelligent. He seems to be quite capable. And part of his capabilities seem to be understanding his rights. At no time did he request to see an attorney. Had he made such a request, we would have honored that request. The 5th and 6th of February was ultimately pretty uneventful. No real new information surfaced and the officers were all staying pretty tight-lipped about the investigation. However, vigils continued, searches continued, flyers continued to be posted, neighbors were delivering stuffed animals and flowers and trinkets as a tribute to Cody. And at this point now, Corey stopped cooperating with police. After that polygraph, Mm, he stopped all cooperation. And I'm sure that this was under the advisement of his attorney as well, which is not super uncommon. However, it also seems that he likely failed this polygraph based on what the police chief said about there being a heated argument after he took it and based on him asking for an attorney immediately following taking that polygraph. I think it's safe to deduce that he probably did not pass with flying colors. On February 7th, the forensic team went back to Corey's townhouse, and they were seen carrying out multiple brown paper bags full of evidence. The next day, on February 8th, Corey appeared in court for a bond hearing. His attorney argued that he had never been convicted of a crime, that he had no failures to appear in court on his record, and that he was honorably discharged from the army, from the military. His attorney argued that Corey would follow all bond conditions, such as an ankle monitor, house arrest, any sort of pretrial check-in. And Corey's estranged wife was in the courtroom and was on Corey's side. She's the mother of the four oldest kids, and she testified that she would help Corey with any court requirements that he had to do. Corey's sister also attended this bond hearing and walked out of the courtroom with Corey's estranged wife. Everybody seemed to be, for the most part, you know, united and in Corey's corner. However, the Commonwealth attorney argued that Corey was a flight risk, saying that he was actually convicted of going AWOL in the military. And going AWOL in the military is a huge deal and a massive 
no-no. And because of this AWOL conviction, the judge ultimately denied bond for Corey because he also thought that he was a flight risk and he also had these prior complaints of violence and DV and all in all wasn't looking to shape up too well for Corey. And as of now, they have a preliminary trial set up for April 5th. Corey's attorney filed an appeal for that bond, and a second hearing has now been scheduled for February 25th to rediscuss bond and possibly set a different amount, or any amount, I should say, and maybe put restrictions in place such as house arrest or things of that nature. So we'll see if the judge holds true to what he was think saying before, no bond, or if he becomes a little bit more forgiving here. Police continued this search for four-year-old Cody. They continued with the investigators, with the neighbors, with the volunteers, and on February 9th, that police chief, Police Chief Talbot, gave a press conference. And he stated in this press conference, from the first minutes of the investigation, myself, the assistant chiefs, the members of command staff, were at Cody Bigsby's residence to see for ourselves what the evidence demonstrated. We have followed the evidence from day one. It was very clear to us. The evidence about what likely occurred has been very clear. There is a little about this that has been mysterious. We certainly haven't closed off our minds to other possibilities. It was very clear to us. The, the evidence about what likely occurred has been very clear. There's little about this that has been mysterious. We've tried hard to avoid a search for a four-year-old boy in, in uh, a, a, a tragedy, an unmitigated tragedy. We, we didn't want it to become a, a sideshow. Uh, we will continue to work and do everything we possibly can to, to uh, figure out what happened to this child. So to me, it seems that they're pretty confident that they have evidence that Cody is likely not coming home and Corey is likely the one who is responsible. And I say this because Corey has obviously now been charged with things that are unrelated directly to Cody's disappearance. and. He's also been vocalized to be the main person and the sole person of interest in this case. So it seems as if they're trying to find a reason to keep him in custody, to press him for more information, to hold him in custody so he can't impede on the investigation or cover things or hide things or anything like that. And we're also kind of seeing this in the Harmony Montgomery case with Kayla, the stepmother, and Adam, the father, and how they're being held on other charges as well because it's almost like you don't want this person walking free and out there to where they could continue to cover their tracks or at wor even worse, flee. During that press conference, a letter was read from one of Corey's family members. And this letter says, as Cody's aunt, the first real que question I have, and this letter says, as Cody's aunt, the first real question I have is where the support from the elected officials of the city is. I have traveled hundreds of miles back and forth to make efforts to bring my nephew home with absolutely no assistance from local officials. Our hearts are heavy. I particularly am outraged. I feel that law enforcement wasted time during the most crucial hours. I need to know why there was so much focus put on the father when that energy could have been put into locating the whereabouts of Cody. It saddens me to know that the disappearance of a four-year-old child is not as important as playing the blame game. And Corey's family has maintained his innocence from day one in all of this. Remember, some of them, even his estranged wife, were standing in the courtroom on his side saying that they will help with any of the conditions that would be set forth with Bond. But what I don't love about this letter is that it's making it sound as though this has been such an inconvenience to go back and forth to look for her nephew. And of course, the focus is going to be on the parents or the family members if that's where the investigation is leading. I don't necessarily think it's the blame game. I think that the circumstances appear to be a little bit dicey. He says that he last saw him at 2 a.m., then something happened mysteriously in the middle of the night. He has self-admittedly left all of the children for hours on end in the home while he goes off doing whatever. He has a history of alleged DV, I mean, if the investigation is pointing in this direction, absolutely he will be a suspect. So to get mad at that and then to say that they're wasting time, I don't, it's my, it's not my belief that this is a blame game. I think they're taking the evidence and it's pointing in one direction. 
But what I will say, and what we're going to get to more in a second here, is I do not agree with everything that law enforcement has done. And they particularly dropped the ball on something mega huge that could screw this entire case up. Cody's mother also released a statement, and in her statement, she says, At this present time, I do not wish to take part in any telephone, television, or social media interview. My reluctance is based on the upcoming trial, and the questions asked are questions that will be addressed in court. In addition, I have been advised by legal counsel not to address the public. However, I would like to speak to the support of the community. I sincerely appreciate all the volunteers, the rescue workers, the police, the FBI, the news reporters, the community at large, family, friends, and everyone who is showing love and support for Cody. It truly warms my heart. I am praying for the safe return of my baby boy, Cody. I hope that the public and the community understands and respects my position during this tragic time. A few days later, on the evening of February 12th, just a couple of days ago, police were called back out to that townhouse where Cody lived. A toddler jacket was found behind the townhomes, as well as tire marks. Police brought in a canine to further search the scene before clearing the scene completely, and they said that it was determined that they aren't sure if that coat belonged to Cody, and no further details were provided. Now, my question here is, his parents certainly probably could identify that coat, and if it belonged to Cody, I know that I would be able to identify a coat that was found and say, yes, my son has that, or no, my son doesn't have that. How difficult is that? to ask, first of all, but also with all the kids now that have been removed from CPS, when is the last time that they are saying that they saw Cody? Are they speaking and what are they sharing? Because although young, at two, at just two two-year-olds right there, a five-year-old could prove to have quite a bit of information. Even the two-year-olds probably can shed a little bit of light. Maybe it's not the most credible and the most secure, but I would imagine they would be able to shed some light as to when Cody was last seen. Now let's talk about where law enforcement just completely dropped the ball with this and potentially has screwed everything up. There was a press conference on February 14th, Valentine's Day. And during this press conference, Police Chief Talbot spoke out once more. He said that after conducting an internal investigation and going through that 100 hours of footage where Corey was being interviewed, they did determine that Corey, in fact, asked for a lawyer twice, and they did not give him one. Now, remember, he previously spoke out talking about how smart Corey is, that he knows his rights, and that absolutely, had he asked for one, he would have certainly been given one. But now he's saying, and I quote, his desires should have been honored. They were not. Okay, that, uh, it's a pretty stark difference there, buddy, from what you were saying before. The lead investigator, who has been with the department for 11 years, has now been placed on paid leave, and a new investigator is taking over. This is a pretty epic fail, and it actually it supports the argument that was coming from the family as far as tunnel vision and the blame game. They may have just, in fact, had their sights so set on Corey that they were refusing to give him an attorney, even though he asked for one. They were refusing to look into anybody else as a suspect, and maybe they did lose critical time. However, despite after this completely epic F up, after being asked, is Mr. Bigsby in jail appropriately based on facts and evidence that were obtained lawfully, the police chief says, absolutely, absolutely. There's absolutely no question. Based on a thorough audit that we've done, I'm even more certain now than I was when I spoke about it previously. He's in a jail cell for appropriate reasons, and we learned that in an appropriate investigation. So maybe this is true, or maybe he's trying to save face. Because again, not a ton of details and concrete evidence has been released as to why they truly think that he is the sole suspect. Corey's attorney seems to be pretty pleased now with how the police department is handling everything. But unfortunately, police are no longer searching on the grounds. They are not searching all day. Instead, they said that they are now going to meticulously comb through the evidence that they have collected. However, volunteers are still out searching, hoping that they'll find something that leads them in the direction of what may have happened to Cody. Shortly after that press conference where the police chief acknowledged that 
Corey did in fact ask for an attorney twice, his attorney makes a public statement and he says, I'm incredibly grateful and proud for our Hampton Police Division today and how they went and reviewed all of those tapes on their own to make sure that there was nothing amiss and when something was, they immediately came forward and made it available to the public. Now the attorney says he still hasn't viewed all of those hundred hours of footage, but I would imagine that this is a pretty big win for him because he can argue quite a bit of what was obtained lawfully or not in those hundred hours of footage. In addition to all of the volunteers and neighbors, the Water Team Inc. has also decided that they are going to help out in the search efforts for Cody. And they have now mapped out a schedule of what's going to happen and what places are going to be searched on what days. And on Tuesday, they are going to search Huntington Park. Wednesday, the Fourth View and Ocean View. Thursday, North King Street. Friday, they're going to take a break. And then Saturday in Langley. So while the police may be just combing through all the evidence to figure out what may have happened, Cody has still not been rescued or recovered. There are no real leads that have been made public. Maybe they know something that we don't. Searches are still underway through volunteers and neighbors, not necessarily the police. And Corey is in a jail cell, but again, on charges that have nothing to do, really, that we know of yet, with Cody's disappearance. So is this case going to go cold, like the Harmony Montgomery case has, unfortunately, so far gone? Is he going to be pursued on these other charges? Although, yes, I, he needs to be held accountable and they should pursue them, but is that going to somehow diminish the light on the actual recovery and rescue of Cody? Are any other sus suspects going to be named? Will more evidence be found? Right now, we're kind of just in a waiting game. We're waiting for the police chief to announce more information, what they found. Although, to be quite honest, at this point, you kind of got to take what they say with a grain of salt because they have kind of fudged up this entire investigation, in my opinion. Um, again, just my thoughts. So I don't know, guys. I don't know. I think that it is extremely strange that Corey willfully left his children multiple times, especially at such young ages. I think it's very strange that he says the last thing that Cody was wearing were Spider-Man flip-flops and wearing all black. Because again, what child is wearing flip-flops at two in the morning? I think that it's very strange that he said the last time he saw him safely was at 2 a.m., but that mysteriously something must have happened in that six-hour window of the middle of the night, whether Cody wandered off, whether he was abducted. I also think that it's mysterious and a little questionable that one of the days in which he left all of the children behind was just six days before he reported Cody is missing. And could he have left those children behind on the 25th because he was disposing of evidence, because he was disposing of Cody, then he comes back, lets everything kind of die down for a few days, then reports him as missing? Possibly. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Who do you think is responsible for Cody missing? Do you think he is out there? Do you think that we'll find him? Do you think that his dad is shady? Do you think that maybe his dad's just not the best parent and left them, but you don't think he's responsible for this? What are your thoughts, guys? Because again, this is a case that so many of you have been DMing me and emailing me, asking me to cover. I want to know what your thoughts are after hearing this information. What do you guys make of this case? So let me know in the comments below. Thanks again for tuning in with me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the coverage. Subscribe if you haven't. Like this video on your way out and comment all of your thoughts below. And I don't, I don't think I'm going to wear this shirt again, guys. I feel like a big bird, but like a barf colored emoji version of it. It's just not, not the business. Anyways, guys. All right. Until the next case, stay safe. Bye.